Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host. Thanks so much for joining in. Um, hope you're doing well. Hope you stick around, subscribe, share, definitely scroll on through some of the episodes and see if there's something else you like. There is a wide range of topics covered on this podcast. Yeah, a true reflection of the inner workings of my brain. <laughs> Anyhow, today's topic in plain language is how eating meat, meat like turkey burgers or roasted chicken, may be a significant source of urinary tract infections, um, what we sometimes call UTIs. Recently, there was a study published about this link in the journal One Health, and one of the lead researchers will be joining us on the podcast to talk about it. I think this will be an interesting topic for many, particularly those of you who know the joys of dealing with a UTI. Mm, of course, I'm kidding, right? I'm kidding. Those things are awful, right? They knock you out of commission, man, and make you put all of your faith in big jars of cranberry juice that you lug around with you everywhere because you have hope. Um, at least until you can get a script for an antibiotic, right? Uh, but that comes with issues too. And we'll talk about all of that in the podcast. Here to discuss this topic with me is Dr. Lance Price, who is a professor at George Washington University School of Public Health in Washington, D.C., and the founding director of the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center. So he's going to tell us more about his research linking UTIs to the meat we eat, He'll also talk about antibiotic resistance and some of the take-home points at both the population level, you know, the group of people we have to share this world with, and the individual level, you know, you at home, me at home, in terms of prevention and such, okay? So give me a few seconds here, gang, while we connect to Dr. Price. Okay, so we're here with Dr. Lance Price and... The name of your paper, Using Source-Associated Mobile Genetic Elements to Identify Zoonotic Extra-Intestinal E. coli Infection, so something really easy that um, everybody can get. Um, <laughs> but before... I wanted to call it, if, <laughs> I wanted to call it, um, what was the original title? Um, Mama said, if you want to know Oh, you can learn a lot about an E. coli by looking at its shoes, yeah. where it's going and where it's been. I put that quote in the paper I saw and it. almost made it the title, right? I saw it, the Forrest Gump quote in your conclusion. Yeah, exactly. That made me laugh because I was like, oh, I've, I've never seen a Forrest Gump quote. I wasn't expecting that. So <laughs> I did. Um, so I, it's like the second proudest moment of my publishing career that one time I actually got a um, some song lyrics into a paper too. Wow. So, That's yeah. <laughs> Nick Lowe, the beast in me about bacteria that live inside of you and then cause yeah. opportunistic pathogens like these E. coli. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's good because I think it gets like people interested in like, you know, topics that may impact them. But when they see these really scientific sounding names, they're like, oh, whatever. It's like nerdy stuff. Um, yeah. But that's that's a different podcast. Um, it all, <laughs> <laughs> every paper sounds kind of nerdy. Um so before we like dive into the research, which is really cool, can you tell us a little bit about you and the work you do? Sure. Yeah. So I I'm the um, like the founding director of the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center at George Washington University. I'm in the School of Public Health. Um, I guess officially I'm a professor of occupational and environmental um, health. <laughs> I don't know why I was forgetting the, the health part, but uh, I, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm a microbiologist by, you know, original training is molecular microbiology. So I'm interested in understanding the uh, evolution, ecology, and epidemiology of, of mostly drug resistant bacteria. Um, and so I also have training in public health. And so I, I try to combine this, you know, molecular microbiology with epidemiology to try to understand, you know, sort of where these drug resistant bacteria are coming from. And, um, and one of the areas that I've 
spent a lot of time is is trying to understand the relationship between um, antibiotic use and food animal production. So we produce all these animals to make meat and, and you know, we give them antibiotics and, and that can drive the evolution of drug resistant bacteria. And so I, I've been trying to understand how that relates to the drug resistant bacteria that infect and kill humans. Well, that's a topic that people can relate to. Yeah. Things, things yeah, that I mean, cause it's, death. What's that? <laughs> things that could cause your death or <laughs> things that cause your demise. <laughs> yeah, care. yeah, exactly. Um, no, no, it, it, that, that, that is an antibiotic resistance is interesting. And it's also scary uh, in a way, you know. For sure. I think it's, I think it's scary. And I, I think there's, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to live my life in fear, but I mean, there are, there are certain trends that we can't ignore, right? You know, I mean, climate yeah. change and, and all of the, and all of the threats that that creates. And then, you know, antibiotic resistance is, you know, is one of the biggest threats that we face today. And, you know, it's, it's these, uh, these couple of, I don't know, trends or, or uh, phenomena that are kind of crashing together. One is, just bacteria are continually evolving, you know, including pathogens that infect us, right? And and so these these bacterial pathogens have evolved mechanisms to or evolving mechanisms to overcome the antibiotics that we use to treat infections. Meanwhile, drug companies have said, "Hey, we make a lot more money on drugs that people take every day for the rest of their lives, and so we're going to quit investing money into these antibiotics that people take for a couple of days, you know, maybe every couple of years, right?" Uh, which they they can't justify the um, the investment based on the returns, right? and and I, I kind of had this naive perception at one time that drug companies were trying to do good things in the world, but uh, you know the, the the real thing is that they're trying to make money for their yeah you know investors, they want right? to make money yeah. yeah I mean that's that's the bottom line um, that doesn't mean they don't I I don't like to get on like. I, you know, big pharma, you know, these reductive terms and like, no. the, the tribalism, they, they, they create some helpful drugs and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's, it would be naive to say that like, oh, they don't care about money. It's all altruistic stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I try not to, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think that those terms are helpful. And, and I also, you know, I, you have to recognize that there are people that go into that because they want to do good things. Right. And that yeah, there sure. are people that sure commit their whole lives to, to trying to develop new, yeah. new drugs to help people. And, and so, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it. but, but, it's but there is a big guy in a nice suit that doesn't give a crap. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> and he has a yacht. Yeah. We know the story. Yeah. <laughs> Several yachts. Um, okay. So one of the highlights listed for your paper was um, that meat, the meat we eat may be an important vehicle for human exposure to extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli strains from food, animals we eat, particularly linked to UTIs, urinary tract infections, which everybody can relate to because they're awful and annoying. Um, but I, can you talk a little bit about this concept? What was known before you did your study in terms of um, this link between E. coli in meat causing UTIs? I know you mentioned other diagnoses in your paper, but I just thought to say UTI because everybody knows what that is. Yeah, I mean, UTIs is, uh, it's the most, you know, it's the most common of the outcomes that we're we're studying. And, and what people might not realize is that E. coli causes most urinary tract infections, like more than 80% of the urinary tract infections that that people get each year are caused by E. coli. And it's, it's almost always the E. coli that you have in your gut, right? So it's, it's, you have some strain and not all E. coli can cause urinary tract infections. So it's a special class. And you use the term earlier that expect the extra intestinal pathogenic E. coli. So that means E. coli that cause infections outside of the intestine. When they're in our intestines, they don't cause any, there's no symptoms, right? They're just doing their thing. We're happy with them. But if they make that short trip from the anus to the urethra, sorry, listeners, but uh, that's an easy trip to make, particularly on, you know, on the female anatomy, right? So sure, short yeah. trip, and then they can set up these infections. They have these special, what we call virulence factors that allow them to um, 
adhere to the cells of the urethra of the urethra and then you know ascend into the into the bladder and set up an infection and then they can ascend, ascend from there up the ureters into the kidneys and then cause deadly bloodstream infections and so um it's a it's a really important group of of organisms to study and um and so you know, what we were really interested in, I, I lost your original question, but I'll just tell you what we're interested <laughs> okay. in. So it's a very um, organic podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so so we know that that E. coli causes most urinary tract infections, and it's the E. coli that we have in our guts. And, and, um, and we were not trying to understand how people get urinary tract infections. There's a lot of science around that. It's we were trying to understand how we get the urinary tract infection causing E. coli into our gut to begin with, because the E. coli that that are the E. coli strains that are in our gut are dynamic, right? So those can change over time, and they're probably almost certainly related to what we're putting in our mouth, right? And so whether that's on our food or just hand to mouth, you know, uh, you know, movement, right? And the world's covered in a thin layer of poo, and and we're inadvertently putting other people's, you know, E. coli in our mouth every now and then, right? And yeah. you know, sorry to be gross, but that's no, that's, that's what no, happens. Okay. Yeah. But um, but there had been a number of studies that suggested that meat could be a source, right? So the of E. coli, particularly poultry. So there'd been um, Amy Mangus, uh, who's up in British Columbia, had done a number of really important groundbreaking studies looking at outbreaks of urinary tract infections and and they really followed this model of a of a you know foodborne outbreak um, Jim Johnson University of Minnesota had done uh, important work um, looking at the strains that are in the food supply and looking at the strains causing infections in his um, the vet the vet population that he was studying um, in and Minnesota so he was at the Minnesota VA and at the university um, and then, but, but studies had gone back to the sixties, looking at, you know, outbreaks in hospitals that were, that were, um, that were traced back to contaminated poultry products coming into the hospital. And so there was this connection, but, but nobody had really quantified how often it happens. You know, we'd seen these outbreaks, but as with the case with most foodborne outbreaks, it's usually, that's just a tiny you know, the tiny tip of the iceberg that most of the, the disease is actually sporadic. And so we wanted to understand how, how often or are people getting um, urinary tract infections from E. coli coming through the food supply? Okay, so you compared the genomes of E. coli from meat that you got from the store with the genomes of E. coli in clinical samples. So you is isolated it from pee and blood samples, basically? Exactly, yeah. So, but I mean, it was a pretty unprecedented study because we went, we studied one small city, Flagstaff, Arizona, for an entire year. And we went to every grocery store twice per month and bought every brand of chicken, turkey, and pork, right? So it's, this was a- Okay, so uh -oh. you purchased thousands of meat. Yeah, so we purchased thousands of, oh, of meat products. Meat products, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what that is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we brought it back to the lab and cultured it for E. coli. Okay. And then, and then at the same time, we partnered with the only hospital in the city, Flagstaff Medical Center. And we, we got all of their pee and blood, as you said. And, and well, they cultured it for E. coli for us. Now, I was curious. I saw Flagstaff. I, why did you pick Flagstaff? Well, there was a very strong scientific reason for this. There I was living okay. there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, so, I, I was just curious. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd, I'd moved. I, I went to help, um, you know, my old colleague, Paul Keim, had started the pathogen genomics um, division of the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Flagstaff, where he lived. And and I used to live there, too. And so I went back to help him with that. And um you know, I was kind of, you know, sometimes I was feeling a little crushed by the small size of that town, you know, having moved back from Baltimore. And, and then I realized it was like sort of a perfect place to study this phenomena. You know, I mean, it was it was small enough to where we could get we could get basically every urinary tract infection, E. coli from the only hospital over the course of a year. And we could go to every major grocery store 
outlet and buy all this meat, right? So it was, I, you know, I've suddenly looked at this city a little bit differently, almost like a little Petri dish, right? And um, I thought, hey, I'm going to study y'all. Most of my podcast listeners are from Flagstaff. I'm kidding, I'm kidding but <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no idea where they're from. They're all over. It's a, I, I was curious when, so you picked out raw chicken, turkey, pork. Why didn't you get beef? <laughs> well, you know, in retrospect, I wish we had, but um, it was a, it was two things. So one, you know, we have, every study is limited by budget. And then two, you know, the work from Amy Mangus and Jim Johnson and, and Lee Riley and others suggested that beef was not, that these, the strains that cause urinary tract infections were not that um, prevalent in beef. And so it seemed like it was going to be kind of a, a waste of resources to study that. Now I've subsequently done, you know, an, another sampling in California with some other colleagues and we've gone ahead and collected the beef so we could see, you know, whether they're contributing any to this disease. And I don't have those data yet. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. I mean, cause I didn't know that I was like, why did they leave the beef out? Um, so you were identifying, you use this acronym a lot, uh, MGE mobile, mobile genetic elements. And you were looking at those in both samples from the meat and the, the clinical samples. Yeah. So one thing that we didn't mention yet is that, you know, so we collected these thousands of, you know, in the end, uh, more than 3000 E. coli, you know, about 2000 from meat and about a thousand from people. And, and we sequenced the DNA from all of those. So that was another sort of at the time, you know, pretty unprecedented to, to sequence genomes at that scale. And, and so we, you know, pulled the DNA out of each of these E. coli isolates, sequenced the DNA. And then, you know, the idea was that we would just draw evolutionary trees and we would understand how the food E. coli was related to that infecting people. And this is what we had done in the past to study lots of other bacterial pathogens. I've worked on anthrax before, I've worked on uh, plague, I've worked on, um, you know, I even worked on the uh, Haitian cholera epidemic, right? And so we identified that the that the cholera, you know, originated in Nepal and came in with peacekeepers. But it turns out that, you know, the tools that you use for an outbreak um, don't necessarily translate to, to um, the sporadic disease that, that we're talking about here. So the sporadic spillover from the food supply to people and then causing, occasionally causing urinary tract infections. So the reason that this doesn't work is that there are 9 billion animals, 9 billion with a B, animals that are raised for meat in the United States each year. And those are virtually all colonized with E. coli. And those are chopped up into billions of meat products and then distributed across the country, right? So even though we had we'd sampled the food supply at this pretty unprecedented level in one, one city, we couldn't possibly sample it enough to define the E. coli population that was coming through the food supply. And so it, it took us... <laughs> took me a, a while to realize that it just, you know, we were not going to be able to define that population using these standard tools. And so it, the thing that we eventually, I don't know if we stumbled on it or, or you know, logic our way eventually was to, to say, all right, well, we don't, we're not trying to pinpoint a particular product to a particular infection. What we really need to do is just figure out whether this E. coli and this flat from chickens, like the, you know, the chicken industry or the ground turkey or, you know, or pork, um, or whether it came from another person. And so what we started looking for were these outs, what we call the accessory genome. So the E. coli adapt to different hosts. So E. coli, you know, this one species can live in all kinds of different animals and in people. And so what we realizes that they're adapting to these different hosts, chickens, turkeys, pigs, people, um, by pulling in different uh, chunks of DNA that help them to thrive in that environment. So what we call um, mobile genetic elements or plasmids in some cases, sometimes they're viruses that that come in and, you know, uh, give them a, a certain a feature that helps them thrive inside a particular host. And so 
what we did was we started doing what we call comparative genomics. We started comparing the genomes of the E. coli from people and the E. coli from uh, the animals. And we started identifying these elements that were disproportionately associated with one host or the other. And then we built this uh, statistical model that would use those to say, to give a probability that an E. coli came from a particular host. So now what we do is we applied that model to all of the E. coli from these bladder, kidney, and blood infections. And we were able to say, hey, you know, 8% of these appear to have come from food animals rather than another person. You know, so then we start to have this, you know, we start to have this estimate of what proportion of human disease, at least in this, in this town, um, are coming from the food supply. And so to, when you, you took the samples, um, the clinical samples, and then you used medical records to figure out what the, they were diagnosed with. Yeah. So we had, you know, we had certain, we had, we didn't have complete information about every patient, right? So we had, you know, each, each isolate was associated with uh, a different diagnosis and, and different symptoms. Um, we didn't, we didn't sign up every person into the study. And so we couldn't get, you know, all the information that we might want to have and, or trace back to them and ask them, Hey, did you eat chicken last week? So we couldn't reach back to the people, but we could look at, you know, age, sex, um, you know, uh, other diseases that they might have, you know, co what we call co comorbidities. And then, um, yeah, particularly what the outcome was. Okay. And you identified 17, uh, source associated MGE. So six associated with humans and 11 with the meat. So those are like those special things you were talking about that they pick up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I so mobile, to mobile, this <laughs> yeah. So let's break down that term mobile genetic element. So genetic element is basically a, a chunk of DNA. Um, you know, the a classic example would be a plasmid. So these round pieces of DNA that bacteria can exchange and and they're because they can exchange and we we say we use this term mobile right so they're mobilizable um you know bacteria it's pretty cool because they can they can actually they'll come together almost like bacterial sex right so they they have what's called a pili a little tube that they can stick in the other cell and then they can make a copy of this piece of dna and feed it through that tube and then it makes a little circle inside the other cell and now they both have a copy it's like spies passing notes, you know, secret cool. notes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. Okay. And so then of the uh, 1,162 clinical cases, so they all had something, some kind of, right. you're, okay. 8.4% involved infected meat was from, was caused, was, was, is that a way to say it? I wouldn't say infected meat. So contaminated. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so I, I, I probably wouldn't put it that way. I, I would, I would say that 8.4% of the, of the clinical infections were caused by E. coli that had a high probability of coming from a food animal, basically. I mean, the way the model works is that it says, did it come from meat or did it come from people? Because I don't know if I'm, I'm going to jump in the weeds for a second. So basically the model worked best to, to, we couldn't pick apart the different meat types like, so I couldn't differentiate whether an E. coli came from turkey or chicken. I mean, they're both birds, right? And so I think this they pull in the same mobile genetic elements to live in both of those hosts. Um, and so, and then we didn't have a, a ton of pork samples, but, you know, uh, basically the, the mobile genetic elements were really good at holding together the, the meat samples are, you know, the E. coli from meat and really good at, you know, differentiating those from people, but not among the different meat types, if that makes sense. Okay. So you couldn't say, oh, this came from a turkey. This came from a pig, basically. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't just say that that way. No. <laughs> clear. Yeah, thank you. No, <laughs> because you know too much about this stuff. That's why <laughs> I don't. So, <laughs> um, for people listening, uh, this, how does this happen? Like they, they go, like just, they go to the store, somebody goes to the store, they buy meat, they eat it. They don't cook it properly. Oh, well, I mean, so yeah. Yeah. There's, um, I'm always 
filtering here. I want to make jokes about. That's, please listening. do. This is yeah, um, a joke friendly podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the ma- movie Laolo? No. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. So there okay. it involves some a uh, 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 kid going through puberty and a. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh um, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there could be direct inoculation, <laughs> but I think, um, <laughs> I think for the most part, what's happening is that people are are you know are consuming inadvertently consuming the the bacteria from the meat. So, you know, you bring in a raw piece of meat into the kitchen and and. Uh, you, you know, we've had this discussion, so you're going to be super careful, right? And you're going to open that package and you're going to put the, put the chicken directly into the pan and then you're going to get rid of that package right away. Right. And you're not going to recycle it because you don't want to contaminate your recycling with all that, you know, those bacteria, because you just assume that's contaminated. And so you're going to open up the cabinet where your trash can is, and you're going to open up the trash can. Well, you've just contaminated the, the, the cabinet handle right and then you're going to turn on the faucet to wash your hands you've just contaminated that pump the soap you've contaminated that you wash your hands you sing happy birthday you rinse them off and you shut off the faucet you just recontaminated your hand you're going to go make a salad right so we know that these bacteria can get around the kitchen very easily so even if you cook that chicken to death you could have still you know introduced those bacteria to the the food you're going to eat, right? Or to a surface. And, and so you can inadvertently get that into your mouth and then it gets into your gut. It is, gets established in the gut and then it makes that trip, right? From the anus to the urethra. Now, I I don't, you know, I was- Wait, I, wait, wait. I I, can I just be gross for a sec? It's, yeah, it's, please. It, it's, it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't just make the trip. It doesn't, doesn't there have to be something that happens like uh like improper wiping techniques or something or well i mean i i i don't know i mean maybe but yeah i mean of course i mean people talk about that all the time you know you want to wipe from front to back but i think there there are people that get frequent utis that probably have perfect bathroom hygiene but they have they might have a short urethra or you know, and okay. I and I just saw a talk showing that you know once you once you've had a, a UTI, you can become you know your body can kind of become even more susceptible to subsequent urinary tract infections. And so, and, and and I have to you know you have to let's stick with gross for a minute. I mean, we're wiping our butts with paper, right? <laughs> you know, dry paper, and we think we're getting rid of the bacteria. Well, you know, I can tell you that there's a lot of E. coli and stool, right? And and right, you know, if you're not washing your butt in a yeah, bidet with soap gonna... and water, you know, there's there's always going to be some there. And yeah. and then you know, okay. you ride a bike, you yeah. know, you yeah. you drive a car, you move around. I mean, there's there's just a lot of opportunity for that E. coli to make its way then, you know, again into the vagina, across the vagina, into right. the urethra. And so, okay, yes, wiping from back to front is a bad idea and could really, you know, yeah. help, help that process along. Sex is also another way that people, you know, sure. people get UTIs um, from, yeah. from sex. Right. And, yeah. and, 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 and I'll just say a missionary could get a UTI, right. You don't have to get super kinky, right. You know, I mean, right, right, right. yeah. I, uh, I remember I had a, I had a, um, a young undergraduate student and, and he explained to me, his perception of how people were getting UTIs from sex. And, and it was, uh, it involved a lot more steps than what, that, what the data say you need okay. to do. So just plain regular sex, you can get a UTI. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> regular old sex, well, wow. however you want to do it. Right. Right. Okay. I just want to, uh, just because I think there's people who listen to this and they, you know, they they don't have like these, I just wanted to make sure we connected the two, like how it happened. Oh, for sure. And I mean, so I, I, I want to, so there's, I think that that's probably how it's happening most, but I do, I don't want to disregard this idea that there could be direct inoculation. Uh, what I mean is that directly introduce the bacteria from your hands into the urethra or the genitalia, because if you think about like I don't know if you've ever made ground turkey burgers or something, right? So when you're handling that meat, you've got to patty it, right? If you're going to make a burger, 
And then you go to wash your hands. There's always kind of that film, right? You know, cause that's, that's fat, right? And when you, and fat and water don't really mix. So, you know, even if you use soap pretty well, sometimes there's still a little bit of that film. You could have these E. coli trapped underneath that film, right? And then look, we, we all have to touch ourselves, right? You know, for whatever hygiene purposes and you could directly inoculate these as well. So I might use an, is inoculation an okay term to use for your listeners? I, I think I think so. <laughs> I, I think the inoculation brings up uh, different mental images for different people. Um, right. But I, yeah, uh, I, I think you explained it well enough for people can relate to that in their day to day, how it happens. Right. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the resistance part. It the way I read it, uh, it didn't sound like it was more resistant than E. coli that originated from humans, um, but it was substantially resistant to the drugs. I, I wasn't like entirely clear on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's funny because one of the reasons we started this study was, you know, because we're interested in that connection between antibiotic use and animal production and antibiotic resistance in people. And the results from this study suggested that, you know, these, that we are picking up these bacteria from these E. coli from the food supply, but they're not coming to us any, you know, any more resistant than the bacteria that we're getting from other people. And, and I think that this is context specific. So in the United States, the FDA has done a lot over the past, you know, 20 to 30 years in terms of trying to restrict the kinds of antibiotics that are being used in animal production. And I've been pretty hard on the FDA over the years, right? Just like criticizing the amount of antibiotics that they allow to be used in animal production. But they've really, they've really done a, a pretty good job at saying, all right, you, you know, for instance, we're not going to let you use the equivalent of Cipro and, and chickens. And we're not going to let you use these, you know, cephalosporins, really important group of antibiotics. We're not going to let you just use those willy-nilly. You can only use those for specific things. And recently they actually restricted uh, or eliminated growth promotion. That is giving animals antibiotics to, to make them grow faster. I mean, for decades, we were doing this, right? We we're just giving animals antibiotics to, to make them grow faster life-saving antibiotics as cheap production tools. It was ridiculous. And so, so because of these controls, you know, I really, you know, when I look in the food supply, you know, we see a lot of tetracycline resistance. We see resistance to certain drugs, but we're not seeing, at least among the E. coli, we're not seeing those that I would call, you know, like the, the super bugs that we're terrified of, these that are resistant to almost all of the medically important antibiotics. Now, when we look at E. coli from in the food supply of a place like, you know, um, I don't want to name a particular country, but uh, in, in Southeast Asia or South America or in low and middle income countries where there's almost no controls on the kind of antibiotics that are being used, we're seeing really, really resistant strains. And so I, I, I think policy matters. And, and it's clear to me that antibiotic use in animal production matters. It's just that in the United States, we've done enough to control it and we have good clean water, you know, we have water sanitation and hygiene and um, that because of those, you know, public health interventions, I, I don't think that the food supply is really contributing a, a whole bunch to the, um, to the drug resistance problem that we have in our clinics today. So that's interesting because people always talk about like, you know, the concern over using antibiotics in animals. Um, so do you, do you think I'm one you, of those people? No, you, I'm serious. I've, I've spent, I've spent a good part of my career. Okay. Talking about this and I do care about this and I, and I think it's a big deal. I just want to reiterate it. I think it's a big deal. Okay. It, it's just that I can't look at my data here, you know, these, these E. coli data and say that that the food supply is that that food animal production is contributing a lot of resistance. That's because we've made these. The FDA has limited the drugs that they can use, and they've banned things like growth, you know, growth promoting antibiotics in animal production in the United States. Now, if we didn't have those, I think that we would have that the picture would be very different. And when I look in places where they don't have these controls, I see a huge threat. Hmm. And. And I think COVID has taught us that, you know, that 
the world is, you know, connected in a ways that we didn't know, and it's connected by microbes, right? And so the fact that drugs are being used willy-nilly in animal production in other countries is a threat at home as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, because something, some E. coli somewhere in a different part of the world could eventually make its way, not that that part of the world doesn't matter. I didn't mean it like that, but just to kind of emphasize we're all connected, like it could eventually get here. Yeah. And I mean, and there's been a lot of studies showing how it does get here. Right. So, you know, people go and travel. Yeah. Right. And when we travel to places, uh, we end up ingesting their E. coli, especially if we're traveling in, you know, low and middle income countries. Right. We, because the water's not, you know, the water might not be clean. Right. Um, right you know, they might not have the sophisticated slaughtering processes. And so the food might not be clean. Right. And so we end up, even if we don't come home with diarrhea or frank disease, we could be coming home colonized with these drug resistant bacteria. And I think most of the time we'll eventually pass them, hopefully without any illness, but every now and then they're going to, they're going to make that trip. Right. And they're going to set up a urinary tract infection, or we might pass it to grandma who's got a a weak immune system. And, you know, and so these things can spread in the community. And there have been very clear studies showing that when people travel from, you know, countries with low incidence of drug resistance to countries of high incidence, that they come home colonized. So, you know, you look at their studies from the Netherlands and, and from Scandinavia showing that people that then travel to, you know, places like Southeast Asia, they come home colonized and they're colonized temporarily and then eventually will pass it, but they can also then pass it in the community. And you mentioned uh, that it was mostly women uh, or females, mostly females. And that's because I guess the anatomy yeah. So, I mean, if you just look at, if you just studied urinary tract infections, um, yeah. you would find that, you know, women have way, way disproportionate right. risk of urinary tract infections. And again, because of the anatomy. Right. Right. And this, this is for the, the cases that originated the UTIs that came from the E. coli strands in food, the food sources, the meat sources. Well, so it's across the board. So, you know, Right, 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 right. But I, yeah, yeah both. it's mostly all, yeah, it, UTI is typically female. Um, and in your study, it was older females, which I think is, actually, I don't know the statistical breakdown between UTIs and older women versus younger, or older females versus younger females. Well, so, I mean, the, you can look at it a couple of different ways, but if you're, if you're comparing the risk between men and women, sort of the, the peak differential, you know, that yeah. where, where the biggest difference is between men and women, it's it's sort of in our, you know, sexual prime basically, and and that's okay. because sex can you know yeah. facilitate the movement of the E. coli. Okay, okay. So E. coli causes six to eight million UTIs a year, generally speaking. And so in your paper, you write four hundred and eighty thousand to six hundred and forty thousand cases could be caused by the sources, the strains of E. coli from the meat sources. Yeah. So that's a uh, lot. what's that? That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So, I mean, that was, I, I have to admit that was the sort of the, um, the simplest calculation that we did in the study, right? So we did a lot of highfalutin analysis in that study, right? With the genomics and the mobile genetic elements. I, and like, that's the parts I skimmed. I mean, I read it, but then I was like, uh, I don't <laughs> There's going to be like three people in the podcast to get this. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it is a major contribution to the science, but you know, you no, can skip it, right? No. It's cool. No, it's fine. I, no, I know it's it's hard to explain. Um, no, but, but if, if no, feel free, like if you can break it down or if there's something that people should, should know, uh, if you could put it in like plain language, because it is, it is very interesting. Well, I mean, I, I the analogy that I use though, and, and we kind of, talked about at the at the opening is that E. coli is one species, but it can live in all these different, you know, animals, right? And and the big challenge for us is like, well, how do you recognize when it came from a chicken versus a person? Well, if you think about people and how we adapt to different environments, we adapt to different environments by putting on different outfits, right? If I'm going to go out in the cold, I'm going to put on a parka. You know, if I'm going to go biking, I'm going to put on those goofy tight shorts and those clip on shoes and, and, you know, I mean, we have, we have these different uniforms that we wear for different 
different work. So when somebody's working, you know, so if you see somebody in a hospital wearing, you know, those blue pajamas, you know, and, and those white clogs, you know, they probably are hospital staff, right? But, but you're in the hospital, you know, all right, you already knew that you're going to be surrounded by people working in the hospital. Right. But if you saw a person in a grocery store wearing those blue pajamas and the white clogs, you would still recognize them as being probably yeah. a nurse or, or somebody working in the hospital, right? A healthcare professional. Yes. Yeah. That's good. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're looking at the little outfits that these, that these E. coli are wearing. And we say, hey, that's the outfit that chicken wears that, that E. coli wears when it's living in a chicken. <laughs> but we found this E. coli in a person, right? And it's got yeah. a chicken outfit on, right? So that's essentially what we're doing. Okay. I like that. Yeah, that 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 makes it clear. People can grasp that, I think. Um, well, that comes back to the, the Forrest Gump quote, right? So he's sitting on the park bench next to a person who's clearly a nurse. Yeah. And he says, those look like comfortable shoes. Right. And he said, my mama said, you can tell a lot about a person by their shoes, yeah. where they've been and where they're going. And that's sort of the yeah. analogy. of the Yeah. Boris Gump. Um, but we were talking about numbers. So you, okay. uh, you said that's a lot of, that's a I, lot of numbers. To and me, I it said, sounds like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I think it's big, right? So 8% sounds like a small fraction, but when you scale it to, you know, the entire United States from Flagstaff, you know, we're talking about half a million infections. So that's a per year, per year, per year, per year. Right. And so that, I don't think we should dismiss that. And I think that this is a new way where we could potentially control this heavy burden. Right. So you, you said, I mean, UTIs are, are painful and Awful. annoying, right? Awful. The thing is that they can and also people be get deadly. them over and over again. Right, because right, there's right. that so you know current UTIs, antibiotic. Well, well, I'll be like, I don't know if this is being gross, but it's like the um, you get a UTI, you treat it with an antibiotic, then you get a yeast infection, then you get a UTI. Right, there's like that cycle. Totally. I mean, I I, I think we have to. I, I don't actually because I'm a microbiologist. I don't think it's gross. I mean, I think it's important to, well, to no, recognize I mean, just, that it's it's, it's just a, a lot of people complain of that cycle, um, because it repeats. And it's really right. frustrating. It's really awful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's because what you're doing is you're, you know, you're throwing off your microbiome, right? Yeah. So you're taking this antibiotic, you're killing off the bacteria in, in the vagina and then the yeast take over, right? Yeah. And then you've got to kill the yeast. Yes. And then the bacteria, you know, I mean, it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It would be, I, it's funny because the, the term microbiome only entered sort of the medical and public health, you know, world, you know, maybe, uh, 15 years ago about, but I, women have known about microbiomes for yeah. <laughs> decades, <Yes>. you know, <laughs> like ever since we had antibiotics, they've known about it. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're throwing my microbiome. They just use a different term. Yes, yes, yeah. But that that's very true. And it's funny, every podcast, the microbiome comes up almost like, it, like in almost every podcast I've, I've done lately, it's like the micro, I don't know, I feel like the microbiome, you can relate it to almost- anything today it's kind of a it's the new human variable it's it's pretty uh i mean it's it's not new but it's the newly recognized I mean, human variable. i heard it really i mean i've heard it related to covid i've heard it related to depression um obviously gi issues you know we study it in, in terms of our susceptibility to infectious diseases so yeah you know um you know, the genital microbiome and HIV transmission, there's, there's a relationship there, nasal microbiome, and whether you're colonized with staph aureus, mm. um, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, you know, yeah. I mean, so these are all things that we're really interested in, in terms of preventing infections. So what, um, I guess I would say like the public health take home points of this at the population level. And then I'm thinking like, if there's anything at the individual level, well, there's, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like to think, uh, think of it on those two levels as well. So on a personal level, I think there's not a lot we can do. We can double down though on the, you know, the food safety stuff, you know, so you, you have to recognize that when you're bringing these products into your house, you, you've 
got to be, you know, aware of your hands, aware of the surfaces, you know, use separate cutting boards, clean those knives, use separate knives. Um, if you're going to make a salad, do that before you bring the meat out, right? And uh, potentially contaminate things. So think about the timing uh, and then just wash your hands, wash your surfaces a lot, right? And and wash thoroughly. Um, and if I was a person that was, you know, uh, had suffered from recurrent UTIs, then I would probably, you know, be extra careful, right? Because, you know, you don't want to ingest the kind of E. coli that can set you up for a new cycle, right? Um, on a on a public health level, I, where I, I think about that, the level that I think about most, right? I would like to intervene way up ahead of this, right? So I, I think that food safety is this, it's a collaboration between the food animal producers and, or the food producers and the consumer, right? And, and too much of it is being pushed on the consumer. So if you think about um, these kinds of bacteria entering the food supply through meat, you know, we can, what we published in that paper was we identified some of the highest risk strains of E. coli. And so, you know, I think it would be great to vaccinate animals against those strains, right? So let's figure out, are they most prevalent in chickens or turkeys? And then let's vaccinate those flocks to prevent those E. coli from ever entering the food supply. You know, wouldn't that be great to just, if we could, if we could, by vaccinating animals, reduce UTIs by 8% in the United States, that would be pretty cool. Vaccinate against E. coli. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is all about, right? <laughs> so the, the studies about E. coli coming from the food supply. Yeah. So vaccinate the animals. Yeah. So, so the E. coli is growing in the animals. We chop up the animals and we make up the meat. The meat's contaminated with E. coli. We bring it in our house. We get the I mean, just the E. coli. We get the UTIs, right? If we vaccinate the animals against those E. coli, then it never enters. Then that it's not in their guts. When we chop them up to make meat, that's not contaminating the meat. When we bring those products home. We're not ingesting those E. coli. So, yeah, we could we could potentially intervene. You know, at the if we get a hundred percent of these these pathogenic E. coli out of the food supply, we could reduce UTIs by maybe 8% in the United States. Would you risk maybe making like a super bug that way though? No, I don't think so. I think the way we'd make super bugs is we try to get rid of them by using antibiotics in the animals, right? So if we tried to drive those E. coli out of the population by using antibiotics, and then we're almost certainly going to be selecting for drug resistant strains. But if we try to get rid of them by vaccination, no, I mean, it's, uh, we, you know, you might, you might lead to strain variations, right? So you might, you would select for other strains of E. coli to thrive in those animals. But those other, those other strains are unlikely to be the ones that cause urinary tract infections, right? It's only certain E. coli that ca can cause urinary tract infections. And those are the ones that we want to eliminate right. in the animals. And, and, and so you know, if the animal is producing antibodies that would, you know, select against those bad E. coli, then the other E. coli would just thrive. Okay. Um, my, I have to ask you a question of a microbiologist, uh, cranberries. Can you call them? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I just saw, um, after work the other day when I always like look for things, I'm like, oh, that's an interesting pod. I saw something about a study recently about cranberries, but I didn't read it. Um, related to UTIs, I think cranberry juice cranberry juice works is is max maximally effective when it's used to wash down the antibiotic that you take for your UTI. Well, that's not so there's been a lot of there's so there's been I mean you know people have talked about cranberry juice for years and, I know. and yeah. some people swear by it. I, I don't think it's held up to rigorous scientific studies, um, but I, I am really hopeful that there are going to be other treatments, right? So there's potentially probiotics that could that could outcompete the bad E. coli. Um, there are some other um, natural products that could, could would basically um, mimic the parts of the cells that the E. coli attached to. And so basically you'd almost like fill up their hands so they can't hold on, right? And they just slip off. That right? sounds so cool. You, 
Yeah, and 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 so I mean, I think the next few years, I'm I'm really actually quite excited about some new modalities to prevent UTIs that don't involve giving people antibiotics and selecting for drug resistant bacteria and giving yeah. people yeast infections and everything else. Yeah, no, I mean it's a it's a huge need. But I know people take cranberries, or there. I know a lot of people also use. Uh, was it D mannose? Right. But, so, so they don't get the sugar. <laughs> yeah. okay. Apparently, you know. I mean, conceptually, that's that's. Um, it kind of makes sense why it should work, but I don't think it works that well, actually. Um, okay. But there are some modified versions of that now um, that okay. that may actually be a lot more functional. Modified. So I just saw a talk on this in Europe, actually, last Modified week. versions of the D manos? Yeah. Of these okay. sugars that will that will work more effectively. Yeah. And and oh, and they like sold as a supplement or not out there yet? Oh, not out there yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And right. and and you've just you've just like completely tapped my entire knowledge on this. Right? Okay. I just <laughs> I just saw it and you just I just saw, saw okay, a I talk on it. I got it. Um well I think that's those were all my questions. Like I always, I always ask, ask like a, um, a big question, like usually it's apocalyptic, but do you, <laughs> you know, when you hear zoonotic, you've heard, we've heard that word a lot because of COVID and obviously mm -hmm. people don't agree on, well, anything with COVID, but, um, do you think that this would be a significant, like antibiotic resistance could be a significant concern for like a next, another future pandemic? There are currently uh, multiple pandemics of drug resistant bacteria going on. They're just not as dramatic as the yeah. as COVID, right? And so, yeah. you know, one of the, there's a strain of E. coli that we've been studying for several years now um, called SC131 that is, it's a pandemic strain that kills lots and lots of people around the world. And it's super resistant. And and we don't really understand all of its tricks, but it's really good at, once it gets in your gut, it's really good at staying there. And then every now and then, you know, it's an, what we call an opportunist pathogen. So it makes makes that trip from the anus to the urethra, and then it can cause bloodstream infection. So the urinary tract, I think is a gateway to the blood, right? So you get to the bladder right. and then the kidneys and then the blood. And, that's, that's and sepsis, so- sepsis. sepsis. Yeah, sepsis, yeah. exactly. Well, a, a serious bloodstream infection can be, yeah. become sepsis, right? And yeah, then you yeah. die. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and so, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's not just in the future. It's not just some theoretical thing. It's happening now. And, and, and if you look at these trends of drug companies closing up shop on new antibiotics and, and the evolution of the continuous evolution of, of new antibiotic resistant strains, I think we're heading very quickly towards a time where we're dealing with a lot of, a lot of pandemic strains of bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was reading recently about some of the STDs, like the antibiotic resistance ones. Uh, gonorrhea is crazy. I'm just, you know. Yeah. yeah. I read about gonorrhea and something else. I don't know, but yeah. Be scary to be a college student these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's that, um, uh, public service announcement, I guess. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, no, I used to always give the drug resistant gonorrhea lecture right before um, spring break. Spring break, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no one wants no one wants uh, to to get uh, antibiotic resistant gonorrhea on spring break, but it does happen. Um, well, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Uh, I, I I like this kind of stuff, and I, I'm sure um, our, my listeners will be very interested in it as well. Well, yeah. Thanks for reaching out. It was it was fun to talk about it, and and thanks for challenging me to not talk like a microbiologist. Yeah, I thought you did a really good job breaking it down. Um, I think like just the image of the 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 person who has the clothes in the hospital and wearing it outside, and it that that's all good. I think that imagery really helps. So oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's important. You can edit to out that Leolo part. Uh, sorry. <laughs> What's that? You can edit out the part about Leolo. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Should I? No, nah, I'll leave it in there. He literally takes a piece of liver and, and cuts a slit in it, puts it in his pants and then lays it on top of it. <laughs> well, I figured it was something like that, but I mean, that's, this is a science 
related podcast. So I it's mean, an amazing movie, by the way. It's like this Italian, uh, you okay. know, an indie Italian film from like 15, 20 years ago. But it's it's a funny scene. Uh, it kind of sad, but funny scene. Yeah. Well, it's just it's another way that somebody could get inoculated. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so i'm not recommending it definitely yeah. wouldn't do that with chicken oh god no <laughs> <laughs> well uh yeah someone out you might have helped someone out there and that's it's a, no judgment it's, it's okay <laughs> um all right well thank you so much and uh yeah i'll probably keep in touch and follow your stuff because i think this is cool Great. And I'd be yeah. interested in hearing about the beef i just because i feel like I feel like Americans eat a lot of beef. I don't know. Yeah, I think beef is a real risk for other kinds of E. coli, um, the kind that cause diarrhea and um, like E. coli 0157. Uh, right, okay. Um, the kind that, yeah, the diarrhea, we call them diarogenic E. coli. Uh, we're going to have a, a string of papers coming out using this new approach because, you know, we're looking at pediatric populations now, so kids with UTIs. Um we're also trying to look globally. So the approach allows us to do things we haven't been able to do ever before, which is now we can look um, across the world and we can say, like, how often does this happen across the world? And does it happen more often in low and middle income countries? And so we're, we've got some um, exciting studies that we're working on right now for that. Very cool. Well, yeah, I will I will stay in touch. I think this is a really interesting and important stuff um, that people hopefully... We get people to care about it and uh, tune in and be good stewards, I guess. That's the yeah. Hope. I mean, we yeah, it's a we all have to yeah be good consumers and good consumers of medicine and meat and and um, you know not demand antibiotics when we have. I mean, and there's just there's a movement now to cut back on meat, a huge movement. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of reasons to do that, you know, including climate change. Um, but I would be a hypocrite if I said too much about it because I hate too much meat. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, a lot of people just want to eat like a hamburger and not think about like these other things. They just want to enjoy a hamburger and there's, there's nothing wrong with that as well. Um, like you don't want to be eating a hamburger and someone sitting next to you, like harping about climate change or antibiotic resistance. You just want to enjoy your hamburger. Um, yeah. Tell me when I'm done. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah yeah but that goes back to public health too like there's um so many so many different people like at the population level have different views and different likes and concerns and so it's it's like finding that way to talk to different people without pissing a bunch of people off yeah for sure and i, I mean i'm yeah because some people are just so focused on their one issue and i'm i'm a harm totally. reductionist Right. So I, I truly believe in harm reduction and I, I oh, learned that, from, you know, from the HIV world. Right. So, yeah. you know, you don't, we can do a lot more to, to battle this if we're not just like judging commercial sex workers or yeah. drug users. And we're just saying, Hey, you know, absolutely. If that's your addiction, that's your addiction here, yeah. use this clean needle. Right. Yeah. And, and I feel the same way about food animal production. There are some people that are just like, no, we need to tear down this industrial you know, food animal production model and and anything you know anything besides that is is a travesty and you're part of this thing and and I'm like yeah you know fight on brother but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get them to use fewer antibiotics so that we can protect these in the meantime right and yeah. and the thing is is using fewer antibiotics in animals forces them to raise them in a in a better way right so you can't you can't raise animals in a way that makes them that encourages their illness and not use antibiotics, right? So, I mean, so I think we need to move to a system where we're raising animals that encourages their health and that obviates the need for antibiotics in most cases, right? Yeah, no, I agree. Like some of the, like the factory farms are, like, are just absolutely awful. Um, so yeah. yeah, if we can get away from that, uh, I'm all for cool. it. Anyway, okay. Thank you so much. En enjoy. Thank your you. Nice to meet you. You too. Okay. All <laughs> bye right. Bye. Headed away. All right. Bye. <laughs> All right, team. Thanks so much for joining in. Please consider subscribing, sharing, reviewing, hitting the support the show link, whatever you do. 
your support is very much appreciated. Thank you um, by me and my assistant, my esteemed assistant, Barnaby, who was also my dog. Um, and I hope you learned something from this episode. Perhaps you'll think about this podcast next time you're making turkey burgers. I don't know. I will admit that after I recorded this podcast, one night I was sauteing ground turkey on the stove because um, I don't really cook much, but I do do that. And as I removed the turkey from the package and put it in the pan with a little sauce and olive oil and threw the package out, and even when I was tossing the meat around with a spatula and splashing things here and there, and then touching the faucet to run water to wash off the splashing cooking meat, I thought about this podcast. And then I thought, oh shit, I'm totally going to get a UTI because I'm a hot mess in the kitchen, right? I'm contaminating everything. There is no hope for me. Um, then I drank some cranberry juice. <laughs> <laughs> true story true story all right now it's time for the closing quote uh some of you this might be your favorite part of the podcast I get it I get it I like quotes too okay here it is ready <clears throat> between urine and filth we are born mm. said by Saint Augustine the patron saint of urine just just kidding just kidding I went to Catholic school and we used to play uh, Catholic trivia. Um, that would be so funny though. St. Augustine, patron state of urine. No, that's not true. But St. Augustine is the patron saint of brewers. And those are people who make beer. And beer makes you do a lot of things, including pee and other activities, right? If you have enough, uh, that might increase your chance of getting a UT high. <clears throat> So I thought, what a perfect quote to end this podcast with. All right, St. Augustine for the win. Okay, guys, that's it for today and uh, see you soon. Bye.